Hello, everybody. My name is Zach Gates, and Merry Christmas. Hi, everybody. I'm Erica. Yes, Merry Christmas. Welcome to Church Online at Trinity. Zach and I are both on staff here at Trinity Green Trails. I am so glad that you are here today. We want to extend the warmest welcome to you, especially if you are new. I'm so glad that our God has brought you to worship online with us at Trinity. We'd love to help you get connected, and that is really Zach's area of expertise. It is. I'm the director of Next Steps at Trinity Green Trails. Uh, if you're new here, uh, again, if it's your first time, go ahead and fill out the Connect card in your chat. Uh, we can get some info about you, share that info so we can connect with you. If you have any prayer requests or anything along those lines, uh, again, we would love to be able to pray for you and connect with you. We have a few sites throughout the Chicagoland area where we're worshiping in person. Uh, you're obviously here at Online Worship, which is awesome. We're very, very glad you're here. Um, but speaking of the Chicagoland area, we just wanted to remind you about the partner that we are working with for the Advent Conspiracy called Collective Chicago. I love this organization, Collective Chicago. So here at Trinity, our mission is to look, live, and love like Jesus. And when we find other organizations who are living out this mission as well, we love to partner with them. So over the past four weeks, we've gotten to work alongside Collective Chicago and hear about the work that they're doing in the city. So they work with men who were homeless and they transition them into total independence. So now these men have their own job, their own paycheck, own place to live, and are able to live on their own because of the work that Collective Chicago is doing. And the more that I learn about this organization, the more excited I get that our church is partnering with them this season. Yeah, again, we've been doing that for the last four weeks, but later on in the service, you're gonna have an opportunity to contribute or continue to contribute to Collective Chicago through the Advent Conspiracy. But before that, let's get started with worship.
This is a reading from Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Well, allow me to add my word of welcome to you all. Uh, Merry Christmas. My name is Nick Price. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is my privilege to bring you our Christmas message this year. And I want to kick off this Christmas message by talking about presents. I remember when gift giving changed for me. It changed when I started to get an allowance. You see, before I had an allowance, I was totally 100% dependent on my parents when it came to buying gifts for other people including for them. And that always created kind of an awkward moment at the store, right? Where I would go off, I would be looking for something that my mom or dad would like, and I wanted it to be a secret, but then it ends up in the shopping cart and they're the ones paying for it. And it just, it was one of those things where it, it kind of took a little bit of the joy out of gift giving because they already knew what they were gonna get. But the moment I got my allowance, things changed. Now I could go and get gifts for my mom and dad without them knowing. I could buy them, I could bring them home, hide them in my room, wrap them up, and then give those to them on Christmas Day and watch the joy on their faces as they opened their presents. It's something that I've never gotten over. I love being able to give gifts to other people. But then I was introduced to the challenge that comes with gift giving, and that is that Christmas comes around every single year which means that now I have to think of a new gift uh, that will be just as wonderful and surprising uh, for the person that I'm giving the gift to. You know, there's this kind of pressure that happens year in, year out, 
as we try to think of, well, what are going to make the best gifts? What can be the best presents that we give to our loved ones? And so a couple of years ago, I actually ended up putting out a social media poll and just asking people, what makes for the best gifts? And I noticed that there were several themes that came back as people responded to that question. Some of the things that people said is they said, you know, some of the best gifts are the personal gifts. The gifts that show that you were really thinking about the other person, what they love to do, what they enjoy, the type of person that they are. Other gifts that are particularly memorable are homemade gifts because it's a labor of love. It's something that you actually take time and energy to put together and then to give away to another person. Uh, Other gifts that people really appreciate are the relational gifts. Those gifts that maybe aren't so much a, a physical object, but maybe an experience. Maybe it's a gift card so that you can go out to dinner at that person's favorite restaurant, or you can go to a museum, or for my kids, they love to go to the zoo. Those things that allow us to strengthen and build our relationship. Sometimes the best gifts are those gifts that you didn't even realize you needed until that person gave you that perfect object, and it just suddenly makes your life that much easier. And likewise, it's those gifts that are long-lasting, the ones that you continue to use year in and year out. People say these are the gifts that make for the very, very best gifts. And the reason why I wanted to talk about gifts is because during the Christmas season, in, in the weeks leading up to the celebration of Christmas, Christians have talked about some of the gifts that God has given us. We use words like hope, peace, joy, and love. We say that these are the gifts that God has given us to strengthen our relationship with him. Those gifts that are beautiful surprises, that are long lasting, those gifts that we absolutely need and that are labors of love on his part as he gives them to us. And this Christmas, I specifically want to focus on one of those gifts, and that is the gift of peace. There's a line in the Christmas story that most people are familiar with. So when the angels appear to the shepherds and they announce something to them, they announce a gift. This is what they say in Luke chapter two. They say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The angels declare that God has given us the gift of peace. But what does that really mean? What does it mean that God has given us peace as a gift? What kind of peace are we talking about? You see, typically when we talk about peace, we tend to think of things like the absence of conflict, that to really have peace in our world means that there's no more wars, no more conflicts between people. Or uh, peace is the absence of conflict within ourselves when we finally feel at peace with who we are and our place in the world. Now, don't get me wrong. Those aren't bad definitions of peace. In fact, I would argue that those are very, very good things. To see wars cease and there to be peace between, between nations. To find people who aren't anxious or angry all the time, but are truly at peace with themselves. But I have to ask the question, uh, the question is this, are those definitions of peace really gifts? I would argue that they aren't. I mean, think about it. If we're talking about peace between nations, what we find is that that kind of peace is often hard and very costly to enforce and to achieve. And often it's incredibly fleeting. Or I think about inner peace, you know, that peace we have with ourselves. And I see how many times anxiety and fear or, or things that disrupt our lives can tip the balance the wrong way. And suddenly we no longer have that internal peace. It takes a lot of self-discipline and self-effort and self-reflection before we achieve that kind of peace. And again, while those are good things and certainly worth pursuing, I wouldn't call them gifts. They're things that we have to work for. They're things that we have to achieve. And yet the Christmas story tells us that God has given us peace as a gift. Let's go back to that passage uh, from Luke chapter 2 for just a moment. Most of us are familiar with the old King James Version, which goes a little something like this. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, if we were to take that translation, uh, what it sounds like is that what the gift God is giving us is actually peace. Peace between people, peace between nations. Yet, honestly, if we just scroll through our news feed, what we find is that we still don't have that. Is that really the peace that God was coming to bring us? Because if so, what it means is that the Christmas story has failed. I mean, all we have to do is take a look at the news to know that 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 kind of peace is elusive. Which is why I'm really grateful for our modern translations, because they get a little closer to what the original text meant. 
when the, when the angels made this announcement to the shepherds. Uh, let's take a look at it from the New International Version for just a second. Here's what it actually reads. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Who are the angels talking about? Well, Luke actually gives us his answer a little bit earlier on in the story. You see, the angels had previously come to other characters in the Christmas story, including Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were cousins to Mary and Joseph. Uh, Mary would become the mother of Jesus, and they were told that they too were going to have a miraculous child. And that that miraculous child, that his job was to actually announce the coming of the one who would be the Savior. And at one point, Zechariah, his father, breaks out into song, and this is what he says. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. You see, what Zechariah realized, what Luke wants us to understand, is that this peace that God is giving to those on whom his favor rests is a peace that comes between us and God. You see, the very definition of peace assumes that previously there had been conflict. There had been some sort of division, some sort of breakdown in a relationship. And the peace that the angels are announcing now to the shepherds is that the conflict that exists between human beings and God is now over. It's done with. What's the conflict that they're talking about? Well, the conflict, the, the barrier that exists between us and God is sin. Now, I understand in our culture, sin is not a popular word. That oftentimes when we say things like sin, it conjures up these images of angry street preachers on street corners with bullhorns yelling at people that they don't even know about fire and brimstone and waving their Bibles around in the air. Or sometimes we think about sin as breaking a set of arbitrary rules created by a fickle God. But we need to understand that in the Bible, in the scriptures, that's not how sin is talked about. That when the Bible talks about sin, what it's talking about is a condition that we and our world find ourselves in. It's a condition of separation from God, which leads to a breakdown in everything else. And it's not too hard to see how true this is. I mean, if we take a look at our world for just a moment, we see evidence of this all around us. In the very things that we long to have peace between, we see it in the violence uh, and the warfare between nations. We see it in the corruption in our governments. We see it in the breakdown of our own personal relationships. We see it in, in things like disease and death and brokenness. It's something that is such an evident part of our world that even when I talk to people who would call themselves atheists or those who would say that they don't believe in a God, they, they start to say things when they encounter this kind of brokenness that sound awfully religious. They turn on the news and they see how people are swept away in tsunamis and they say things like, well, that's terrible, that's horrible. They hear about violence on our streets and they say, that's wrong, that's not the way it should be. And honestly, as Christians, we would agree with them. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the way our God created this world. He created this world with beauty and goodness and light. And yet we, in our desire to run the world and our lives our own way, broke that relationship. We said that we wanted to basically live life on our own terms. We turned our backs on the one who is himself, hope, peace, joy, and love. And so it shouldn't surprise us that when we cut ourselves off from our relationship with God, that the rest of the world begins to unravel. That things like hope, peace, joy, and love become elusive. This is what we're talking about when we talk about sin. We experience it all the time. We experience it in our jobs, our relationships, how we go about our day. We find that it lurks there even in the moments when we think we've finally gotten everything that we longed for, when that promotion comes through and we get that pay raise and yet we find it's still not quite enough. There's still more respect that we desire. There's still more money that we could have to feel financially secure and safe. We experience it even when we finally have that relationship only to realize that it's 
torn apart by things like misunderstandings, self-centeredness, and leaves in its wake broken hearts. You see, all of these things, they're symptoms. They're symptoms of a world that's broken by sin, that's at odds with God. And no matter how hard we try to enforce the peace between us or look for the peace within us, our heart still cries out for something deeper. It's to be reconciled with the one who made us. It's to finally know the God who is himself, hope, peace, joy, and love. And that is exactly what the angels are announcing. They're saying that that peace is now given to us as a gift. And that's what I think makes Christianity so beautiful and so unique. When you look at all the other world's religions, what they tell you is that if you want to have peace with God, if you want to have enlightenment, if you want to experience the joys and the wholeness of heaven, you have to work for it. It's up to you to establish that peace. It's up to you to clean up your act and to be suddenly now welcomed into the presence of the divine. And yet here at the announcement of the angels, what they're telling the shepherds is that you don't have to do a thing. That God is making peace with us. That that's what he has come to do. It is this beautiful and incredible promise. And what I love is that they don't just make this announcement, they then give them a sign. I want you to listen to what they say next as they speak to the shepherds. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. It means that not only is peace announced, but but peace is given to us on terms that we can finally understand. They're told to go and seek out a child. This isn't just going to be any child. This is God himself who has now entered into our world to make peace with us. It's a staggering promise. I mean, if you really stop and think about it for a moment, what God is telling us is that not only does he make peace with us, he makes peace with us on our own terms. He comes to us in ways that we can understand. By leaving his throne in heaven, by coming down here and living life with us, just like one of us. I think that's the reason that the shepherds were so overjoyed when they finally found the baby Jesus as they realized that their God isn't a distant God who's unable to relate, but that he's one who understands their poverty, understands the difficulties and the heartaches and pains of life. And yet he came anyways at great cost to himself in order to give us peace with him. And that's the other thing that I think makes Christianity so beautiful is that it's meant to be a sign. It's evidence to us of God's love. I mean, again, think about that for a moment. What we're basically saying is that you don't just have to take this, this promise at its word. You can actually go and explore the evidence for yourself because God entered into our world in time and in space and in history in ways that we can see and understand, in ways that we can explore and examine for ourselves. That's what the angels tell them to do. They don't simply say, hey, just take us at our word for it. No, they say, go, find the child. This is a sign for you. And maybe that's the gift of Christmas that some of you might need, is that you need to explore the evidence for yourself. I know that that's important because, quite honestly, that was my story. I wasn't raised in church, and actually, as a teenager, I didn't really believe in God or Jesus. One of my favorite things to do at the lunch table was actually to debate my Christian friends, uh, to try and show them the ways in which there were all these holes in what they said they believed. And yet, one of the things that amazed me is the more and more I talked with the Christians in my life, the more and more they started to put evidence back in my hands. They gave me book after book after book that was written by experts in the fields of science and history and philosophy that showed that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus has more evidence than anything else on the face of the planet. And I was encouraged to explore the evidence for myself so that I could know the truth of what I'd been told. God gives us signs so that we can believe. And it ultimately points us to just how that peace is achieved. He didn't just come into this world to give us some great teachings or provide us with better advice. He came to lay down his life for us, for the ways in which we've turned our backs on him, the ways in which we've rebelled against him, all the ways in which we've lived selfishly rather than for others. 
Christ took all that on his shoulders. He died for us and rose again to say, now you can know that that peace which is promised is yours now and forever. And so maybe you're, you've been wrestling with peace these past two years. Maybe the brokenness of our world has been so overwhelming. You're wondering where, there's, where the hope can be found. The answer of the angels to the shepherds is the answer that they also give to you. You can find it in Jesus. The one who came, died, and rose again for you, that you might experience the peace that only God can give. Likewise, I know that there's some of you out there that you know that peace. And so maybe the gift that you can give this Christmas is giving that gift of peace to others. Jesus says that blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons and daughters of God. You see, when we realize that we have peace with God, we suddenly become peacemakers in our world. I love how Tim Keller puts it in his book, Hidden Christmas, talking about the power that this gift of peace actually gives to us. Here's what he writes. Peacemakers are people who, through making peace with God, have finally learned how to admit flaws and weakness, how to surrender their pride, how to love without the need to control every situation. These new skills have enormous power to diffuse conflicts, to facilitate forgiveness and reconciliation between people. You see what he's saying? He's saying once we know that we have that peace with God, we are able to give it away freely to others. We don't have to assert our own will and our own ways. Rather, we can humbly come and offer that kind of reconciliation and forgiveness to others, not because we're perfect, but because we understand the gift that we've been given. And that kind of peace, given as a gift, has the power to change the world. So this Christmas, the gift that God desires to give to us once more, the reason we dust off this story is to be reminded of what he's done for us, of the peace that we have, and the peace that we can now give. It's part of the reason that we get to sing with the angels. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. It's in the name of Jesus, who is indeed our Prince of Peace, that we say Amen and Merry Christmas. Try
worship by worshiping with our giving now. This is the time where we bring our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. Our tithes simply meaning that 10%. And your gifts go directly to our mission as a church to look, live, and love like Jesus. And this continues the life-changing, transformational work of the gospel that our God is already doing at this church. So thank you in advance and thank you for all the gifts that you've been giving to Trinity. We mentioned earlier our partnership with Collective Chicago, uh, that organization that's helping homeless men find their way into independent living. Um, that partnership emerged from what's called the Advent Conspiracy, our challenge to worship fully, spend less, give more, and love all. Those countercultural values that seem to clash with some of the values that we see coming uh, from our, our culture uh, here during this season. So we want to challenge ourselves to kind of be like our Savior, to live counterculturally. Uh, he left heaven and was born here on earth and then served humbly to the point of death on a cross. Uh, we want to challenge ourselves again to live counterculturally and give out of what we would normally spend. Um, so you have that opportunity right now to designate that money either to a tithe or to the gift to Advent Conspiracy and Collective Chicago. So I want to encourage you to do that and challenge yourselves in that gospel way of living. It was a joy to worship with you this Christmas. We're really happy that you came. I uh, want to encourage you, again, if you're new and want to get connected with us to fill out that Connect card, uh, help give us some ways to pray for you and help get you plugged in here at one of our sites. And if you'd like to stick around immediately after this online service, we're going to have the opportunity to sing some Christmas carols together. 
But before that, receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Thank you.